The following program is brought to you by Fanbags Cornhole, Chicago's official supplier of professional cornhole boards and bags. Choose from any of their officially licensed designs or have my boy Brian design a custom set using anything from a selfie to your company's logo. Visit www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS to get 10% off your entire order. That's www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS for 10% off. Step up your game with fan bags, cornhole. It's Zach Eady with the Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to the Boilers in the Stands post-game show. I am your host, Greg Braggs Jr. Alongside me, as always, is my guys, Joe Jackson and Craig Bowers. Purdue drops one in dramatic fashion in overtime to the Wisconsin Badgers. Wisconsin moves on to the Big Ten Championship and will take on the winner of Illinois versus Nebraska, while Purdue looks ahead to March Madness Selection Sunday will be immediately following the championship game, and then we will find out what the road is for Purdue to get to the Final Four. Purdue loses their fourth game of the season, uh, and obviously Wisconsin really had a good game plan here today. We'll talk a lot about it, um, you know, especially with the way they pressed Purdue full court really made them take a minute to get across half court and get into their sets, you know, uh, just like every team trying to execute a physical style of basketball and uh, certainly seemed to get the best of guys like Braden Smith who fouled out at the end of the game, uh, big turnover at the end of regulation uh, by Zach Eady. Uh, trying to get it to Braden Smith, a little bit of a miscommunication there that opened the door for Wisconsin to tie it. Uh, Zach also missed a free throw that may or may not have sealed the deal and put them up three. Instead, uh, you know, Chucky Hepburn has a nice play going to the rim to tie it at the buzzer in regulation and Purdue falls. So, you know, uh, it's funny because we had talked about yesterday, like, you know, do we do we want them going all the way to the championship? And I've said last week and I said throughout the week, even to some of my guys at CHGO, I, I really didn't really want them going three days. So there's the rationalization that everything's OK, that they lost. But at the same time, I'd be lying to you if at the end of regulation or if in, in overtime that I started to get pissed off that they weren't going to win or that they didn't win. And, um, you know, so that's kind of the, the crux as a fan there, because I think we all understand Purdue has bigger fish to fry, but watching them lose a game is never easy. But at the same time, Purdue did battle their asses off. They did not take the day off by any means. Um, you know, it's, it's not a pretty game, so I'm sure Craig's going to have his own thoughts, but at the same time, you know, they, they, it's not like they didn't show up. Mason Gillis hit some big shots. Zach Eady continued to be the guy he is. Uh, Fletcher Lawyer hit a big three at the end. Um, you know, so obviously there were some miscues that led to the loss, and we'll get into some of those reasons. But um, still feel good about Purdue's aspirations in the NCAA tournament. So they drop one. So now they just got to win six in a row. 
to seal the deal here in March. Uh, Craig, I'll start with you. Give us your instant reaction, my friend. You guys know that Travion Williams meme or the gif where he's like, it is what it is. And he's shrugging his shoulders. Um, that, that's how I feel about this game. Um, honestly, had a hard time kind of getting hyped up for today because I felt like it was a lose lose. Like if they lose, people are going to the narrative is going to be, well, what's wrong with Purdue? Yada, yada. Um, if they win, they have to go and play another game on Sunday. I, you know me, Greg, I, I'm not a big conference tournament fan. I am perfectly fine with the extra day rest. Um, in all honesty, I thought for large chunks of this game, it looked like Purdue was kind of moving three quarter speed and just going through the motions at different times. Obviously have no idea. Um, you nobody who knows that, I guess, other than people that are actually in the locker room or in the players' heads or anything like that. Intensity certainly ramped up in the second half, but uh, another game where Smith gets some rest. Well, he plays 36 minutes, I guess, on the end, but he'd gotten some foul trouble and had to go to the bench a couple times, but he he actually didn't get much rest. Um, I, I didn't think Smith looked fully healthy. Just thought he didn't look like he had the same burst. Thought there were some times where he normally would have gone ahead and tried to, to burst towards the rim after coming off that pick and roll when he didn't. Thought there were some times on defense he just looked laterally like he wasn't near as quick as he usually is. Um, so I'm okay with him sitting out tomorrow, resting up for next Thursday. And at the end of the day, um, Zach plays 29 minutes in an overtime game. We got to run Miles Colvin again for significant stretches and see some of the things that he can do in rotations that painter might like to do um if those situations present themselves in the tournament so my view of this is it is what it is yep uh, uh joe why don't you give us your instant reaction we'll get into it all so instant reaction is this game has no real um it doesn't change how i feel about the actual tournament i, I still fully believe in this team but um I can't lie. I'm pissed about this loss. Like I really am. I think this was a game that Purdue just handed it away. Um, it was a game that for a while they didn't have to play full speed. They didn't go full speed um, and they handed it away. And this is a game you very easily win. You limit a few turnovers, you knock down. I mean, they didn't shoot terrible from the line at all, but um, a couple, a couple in the, in the clutch, you get a couple stops guard play. Wasn't great. And, and like I said, I don't think this is any indication of how they'll do in March and, and I know that's what the entire media, you know, national media will be and Twitter and all that stuff. That doesn't affect me. It's more of just like a, like, even if they weren't, maybe there seems some times where maybe they weren't playing as crisp as usual or whatever. At the end, it, they wanted to win. And this seemed like the players wanted to win. I wanted them to win. Um, like, and, and credit Wisconsin, they made some big plays, but I, I do think Purdue just kind of handed them this. Um, and that's just what kind of upsets me is this one was in grasp and, and they just, they let it go away. Yeah. And, and so um, the other half of the rationalization, aside from the fact that some of like, we were all kind of in the mindset, even yesterday, like, Hey, if they had lost yesterday, we wouldn't have been that upset as far as, you know, just having bigger fish to fry. And, you know, obviously yesterday there was some worry that Braden Smith, you know, almost was out for years. Zach Eady took a bad hit. There wasn't really any of that today outside of just physical play in general. Uh, then it goes to overtime. And then I'm starting to think, well, if they win this game, then you play another game tomorrow just adds to the mileage. But then the other half of the rationalization, which it certainly is to a degree is, you know, it's a, it's a learning lesson. There's a learning. Uh, now they can go back to the tape you learn a lot more from your losses than you do from your wins because it gets you a little bit on your toes. And Matt Painter, I'm sure certain, will take them into the film room and they'll talk about it. I mean, because we saw it in back-to-back -back days where the game was slowed down, and I'm sure that they're going to see some of this in March. And, you know, they were pressing um, the length of the court to slow Purdue into their sets. And even when they got it across half court, they were really – you know, face guarding and really getting into Braden Smith and Lance Jones and forcing them to do things that aren't really within what they've been doing all season. So these are challenges they're going to have to face, you know, here next week. So, you know, a learning lesson. Then the other half, the third and final rationalization is that it's a law of averages. They hadn't lost since Ohio State. How many games in a row did they win 
since six. they last beat. They won six in a row. So had they won this game and potentially tomorrow, you know, that's eight game winning streak. They'd have to finish the year on a 14 game winning streak. I mean, they certainly are capable of that. And whether they win or lose today, maybe doesn't necessarily correlate to them going all the way to the title. But at the same time, as somebody that does believe in the law of averages when it comes to sports, uh, I, do, I don't hate this. I mean, I understand the frustration with the loss and the way they gave it to them. But when you lose, there's going to be elements as to why you lost. You know, you're ne- there's no perfect way to lose in my mind. Um, and so Purdue, you know, obviously had some mishaps uh, and, and that's it. So we'll get into some of the breakdowns of, of the game itself. Uh, we can go over some of the stats here, um, you know, uh, of the game and Purdue shot 45% from the field, uh, Wisconsin shot 43%, but Wisconsin got 74 shots up compared to 51 for Purdue, uh, and Purdue shot 31% from the three point line. Uh, so that's obviously, you know, took a hit for them five or 16. They started to heat up a bit in the second half in the first half, they were ice cold. And then, uh, from the free throw line, you know, a, a big disparity, Wisconsin only shoots nine free throws to produce 32, but Purdue misses eight free throws, including a crucial miss by Zach Eady at the end of regulation, which opened the door for Wisconsin to tie it zero points off turnovers for Purdue 15 for Wisconsin. So, uh, those are some of the different stats that certainly stand out eight steals for Wisconsin as well. So, uh, when you see some of those stats guys, you know, what stands out to you, Craig? Um, I mean, obviously the turnovers and Painter will talk about that often. Um, he likes to say, you know, if it gets up into double digits, then Purdue's going to have a hard time winning. Uh, just as I've followed Purdue over the years, to me, that number's a dozen. If it gets above 12, um, usually Purdue's going to have a hard time winning the game. And, you know, it's kind of frustrating today. <clears throat> I guess if, I, if I'm going to get frustrated about something, um, what was frustrating today is a lot of those turnovers were just focused turnovers. It, it wasn't even Wisconsin really putting that much pressure on the perimeter at times. It was just guys making lazy passes, not looking to make sure there wasn't somebody in the passing lane before they threw them. Um, you know, Chucky did a really nice job on Braden. Uh, so take nothing away from him. But some of those others were just, I mean, Gillis fires a ball like four foot over Zach's head at one point in there and just seemed uh, to be focused on, um, issues leading to a lot of those turnovers today so obviously they got to clean that up going forward i don't think that's i mean I, i'm not super worried about that um we didn't necessarily had zach had the one turnover versus the press um i think that's the one danger putting zach down there in that situation is i think anybody else realizes that brayden's got the entire court behind him and just kind of lobs that ball up for brayden to go chase it down instead of trying to make a bullet pass to him um I still like that design, um, but that's something you may run into if Zach's catching the ball there and having to turn and make a throw. So yeah, um, turnovers, man. Yeah, no question about it. And and Wisconsin, when you talk about pitching a perfect game that we talk a lot about on the show, and that's the the you need to pitch a perfect game to beat Purdue. Um, and they in Wisconsin again, Purdue played not well today, and they still could have won and took it all the way to overtime and had the lead with five seconds to go, three seconds to go. So, you know, that, that goes to show you just how hard it is to beat Purdue because they didn't shoot well from the three point line. They turned the ball over 16 times and Wisconsin only turned the ball over five times. So they, they played really well and they've been, they've been trending upwards here in the last week, week and a half. Um, despite them losing to Purdue at Mackey, they, they have been starting to play much better when they went on that bit of a slide, you know, at the, you know, around the middle point or, second half of the Big Ten schedule. Corey Lesney here in the chat uh, says, the management of the bench has been a disaster all season long. Colvin doesn't play for six weeks, and now he's in. Heidi and Morton's minutes are all over the place. No one has any confidence. Now, I wouldn't necessarily agree that no one has any confidence, but I do think Miles Colvin was like this bright spot in the game today. I thought he played well. Uh, You know, he's just playing more, and it does remind me of when Brandon Newman, who didn't play for a long stretch of the Big Ten play, all of a sudden started getting minutes at the end of the season, which, you know, is wasn't part of the rotation all year. So I'm curious 
your thoughts on Corey's thought and, and just the observation of all of a sudden Miles getting minutes, or do you think now when once we get into tournament play that that'll get geared back again? That'll you- be it. It'll be um, my assumption is the seven eight man rotation, and then Colvin and and um, Colvin more than first will be brought in when needed. Would be my guess. And, and um, yeah, I, I don't agree with the confidence thing whatsoever. I. And even before, like the last few games, um, even this was the weird one with Bray, Edie gets the early foul trouble. Brains has some foul trouble. And so you just get these weird rotations today specifically where it's like, yes, you don't have the context of running the same rotation that they ran the past six games, which they have, where it's Heidi's first off the bench. Gillis is first off the bench. You're going to bring Morton in for a couple minutes. Colvin does get a couple more minutes because of foul trouble these past two games. Um yeah, I, I disagree with the confidence thing. And then I think the, the rotation, like Painter's had a rotation the past. I mean, I could pull it up. I, I feel like Heidi's been the guy for the past four or five, five games at least. Um, and it, I think more than that. Even more than that, yeah. And then it's first first Colvin and, and Morden are more just kind of specialty. Um, and, and you bring him off the bench. So I, I expect it to go back to that seven man and then bring in the other three when you can. It's good that they've gotten minutes. Because they're just a little, especially Colvin is right. You might need a little bit of run. Yeah, there you, you might, might need him at some point. But and, and um, he shows, and he shows that he's not afraid to shoot, which is a big yeah. step for a rookie. He's obviously not afraid to shoot. Uh, you know, and he he can do some things on the glass, rebounding, and you know he's got the length to defend, but maybe not, you know, the technical aspect of it down yet, or knowing always, you know, where he's supposed to be. Just young in the system. Uh, the other, the big moment of the game too, though, was. You're up, what, two or three? You're up two, and they inbound the ball to Zach Eady in regulation, and he goes to pass it to Braden Smith, and Braden is going up court, and Zach threw it to a spot. And, um, you know, Dick Stillwagon here saying that pass from Zach, throw up emoji, but I almost wonder, and I want to hear your guys' thoughts, and I'll start with you, Craig. Like, should Braden have been stationary? Or was that was that pass out? Who was that that turnover on, Zach or Braden? Um, well, I already talked about it when we were talking about the turnovers, but um, I I don't know. I don't know if if Braden needs I, that. Looks like a design play to get Braden um, down to the other end of the court, so he's supposed to be in motion running down that direction. Um, like I said, I think you know if that's a guard or wing catching that ball, they realize Braden has the entire court to himself and just kind of lobs it down and let Braden run over it instead of trying to pass it to a specific spot like Zach did. So um, I don't know if there was contact on that pass or not. In those situations, you got to be really strong with the ball and strong with the pass in that situation. I did want to say something about the rotations in, in regards to Colvin, though, and Heidi both. Um there was foul trouble in the last two games that led to more of that, but it still felt like Painter made a purposeful decision to give those guys more run. And I think that says maybe a lot about how he was treating the Big Ten tournament, uh, that he he wanted to give those guys more run. So when we get into the NCAA tournament, he has a little more confidence if he needs to throw Miles out there. I think the most important thing that Miles did in the last two games is that he showed that he's improved much better defensively than when he got in the games in December and January. He had two massive defensive plays in today's game, had a really nice defensive play on the steal in the last game. So I think that's going to give Painter a lot of confidence if we're struggling shooting the three ball um, that he can throw miles out there to try to see if he's got a hot hand and that he's not going to let down on the defensive side of the ball. But I think that was intentional to some degree beyond the foul trouble to give both of those guys run more run. So we've got Bill Bill in the chat who's saying he's ready to refund his tickets to Indy. He's saying here in the chat, teams that play Purdue in the tournament will use this game uh, for teaching how to play us. Big trouble. There's He's what, panicking. What thing, what thing happened today, Bill Bill, that teams have not done to Purdue at some point in time during this year? Wisconsin did nothing today that hasn't been done to Purdue at different times before. This isn't a blueprint. Joe? Yeah, I agree. It's like Wisconsin was just able to capitalize enough because I don't even think Wisconsin played like great. Um, they knocked down some big time shots, especially. I mean, Chucky was phenomenal today for sure, and he's the big reason they won. Um, it was just a lot of Purdue beating themselves. I feel like at times so you have the the careless turnovers, you have just no no 
the I've said it before that the thing is you're going to have Edie do his thing, right? You need Smith to play well. He didn't shoot the ball well. Um, he wasn't like great. He wasn't terrible. And then you need some other guard to really step up for a little bit. It was Jones. Um, but aside from that, you didn't really get any perimeter player to step up. Um, and even like the physicality and you pressure the ball, like pressure the guards. I think it took Purdue out of them, out of it a little bit, but I, I think like a lot of the turnovers, EDS four, Gillis is three. A lot of those were just like, you know, doubling the post and, and then pass outs or, or passing into the post or moving the ball. Um, a lot of it was just, it was just simple, careless stuff. Like, and that's why, like, I, I think it's very fair to criticize this game. I'm, I already said at the top, I'm not happy with the result of this game and, and I'll be probably happy, ha happier tomorrow with the rest and also just all that stuff. So, but at the same time, to me, it doesn't like you. UConn last year, UConn lost in the semis, I, I think, right, of the Big East tournament. And then they steamrolled March Madness, steamrolled. I'm not saying Purdue's going to do that. I'm just saying, like, this loss doesn't, to me, indicate anything that's going to happen in March. We know what this team has done. And there's a bunch, there's a bunch of things that um, I don't know if we want to get to now or later in the show of just like, hey, this, this loss is. In the grand scheme of things, this loss is pretty meaningless. Well, to your well, point, and, hold on real quick. To your point, Christopher Tice says in the chat, after every loss this year, Purdue has won at least the next six games. That's an interesting stat. Exactly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you, Chris, uh, that, that that stat is correct. I'm it assuming is. it is because their four losses uh, were spread out, whereas last year, you know, they had a bunch of losses at the end of the season and kind of backed their way into tournament play and then won the Big Ten tournament somehow, uh, even though they they weren't playing their best brand of basketball heading into tournament play. So this year, I think they've been much more consistent, and yet they didn't win the Big Ten tournament, and that's just how it goes. I mean, it's not easy. Another, here's the fourth rationalization. I thought I'd keep it to three, but it's never easy to beat a team three times in a row. I, I it's that's 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 basketball, ladies and gentlemen, and and so you know it. That's another element of it is the familiar air familiarity i'm just butchering that word right now somebody else say it for me uh but when you were going on yeah thank you that's what i was trying to say but when you were going on your little rant joe um like people were literally say tweeting or i mean chatting exactly what you were saying you know you said beat ourselves that's okay boiler at the exact same time said we beat ourselves that's it then you mentioned turnovers that's obvious both you guys mentioned that jim smith same thing pretty simple but david jenkins said physical on ball pressure on the guards. And, and that's something I brought up. And there was a lot of times in this game where all of a sudden it's getting to the end of the shot clock and Braden is just chucking up a, a contested shot, you know, and, and he's made some of these, you know, he's capable of making them, but they're not high percentage shots. And for Purdue, who's one of the most offensive, one of the best offensive efficient teams in the country, the last four years, five years, it was surprising to see Wisconsin able to get them taking inefficient shots, right? Yeah, no doubt. And I, I mean, it's, it's not the first time a team's tried to be, it's really hard to limit the pass, the entry post feed to Zach. So you're going to do one of two things or both. You're going to double really quickly after Zach catches the ball, which a lot of teams have done basically everybody other than Michigan state. It feels like, and you're going to try to put pressure on the guards to make that entry pass harder. Um, I thought Wisconsin did a decent job of that today. I, I thought what Wisconsin did better was was staying on our three-point shooters. Um, we end up shooting, I think, 31%. If, yep. if Jones doesn't heave the half-court shot there at the end, they end up probably around 34%, some, 33%, something like that. Yep. Um, not a terrible three-point shooting day, not a great three-point shooting day, but we just didn't take a lot of them either. And I thought Wisconsin did a really nice job. Other, they let Fletch get loose once and they let Mason get loose once. But the rest of those, um, they stayed up on the three-point line and had a hand in our face most of the time today. But when you play, like you, to your point, you know, guard's been at Wisconsin for quite a while now. So he knows Purdue's actions. And then they play twice this year. So your AJ stores of the world, your Blackwells of the world who haven't, you know, they're going through trying to simulate it in practice, but they really can't. They're getting their third shot of that. And, and they know everywhere that Purdue is going to be um, off of their actions or normally where they're going to want to try to be. So it just gets extremely more difficult. And when we get into the NCAA tournament, 
that's not going to be the case. Um, most likely, you're going to play a bunch of teams that have never faced Zach Eady, can't simulate Zach Eady um, until maybe we get into some later rounds. Yeah, and or, think, we, or I'm sorry, or we come across another Big Ten team. That's fair. I just want to, yeah, the 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 scouting report I tweeted it out. Like, I think two two or three of of um, Chucky steals specifically, and maybe maybe it was credited to others because it like bounced around. But like two or three of them were literally, I think, just scouting report of they just knew Purdue was going to flow into their high low action at the top of the key. Chucky just kind of hid and then popped out. Um, and then you have that combined with probably a little bit of lazy passing as well. Uh, especially from Gillis, who I think aside from the passing had a really good game, but um, just, yeah, I, I think there's that aspect too, where it's in March, you're not going to get that time. Um, usually, you know, especially if, if it's, if Purdue, if, if Purdue wins the first round, you know, you get a one day turnaround into that second round, not a lot of time to scout. And I know you have advanced scouts and all that stuff, but just wanted to add that in there. So Derek Mulligan says ready for the tourney, baby. Oh, yeah. I like the positive attitude and tomorrow we'll still be here for you. We will go live for the tournament, the, the NCAA March madness bracket reveal. We'll be live for that. And we'll break down as the, as the bracket unfolds. And we'll react to it all and 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 see what the road is. The roadmap to the final four is for Purdue. Once we find out some times as well, as far as when they're going to play, which uh, by all indications will be in Indianapolis on Friday and Sunday. Uh, then we'll find out what time they're playing each day. And depending on those times, we'll try to set up some kind of a meetup uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, so I'll be thinking about where, Potentially we can meet up because I know the city is going to be packed and we're going to have to try to pick a, a, a bar where we get some space potentially of, of to get everyone to hang out together. Uh, but stay tuned for those kind of announcements. Make sure you tune in tomorrow uh, for the bracket reveal show. Make sure you hit the like button as well. Uh, if you're here on YouTube and subscribe to the channel, if you haven't already, uh, we're very excited for March Madness. We've all been looking forward to this. You know, um, since the Fairleigh Dickinson loss last year, a lot of unfinished business here for the Purdue Boilermakers. And if they didn't have a bad taste in their mouth um, from dating back to last year's loss and something they're constantly reminded of, you know, maybe this loss here today with Wisconsin puts a little bit of that uh, salt and vinegar back in their mouth a little bit. Uh, you know, but this team has kind of stayed on their toes this whole year and stayed engaged. So I think they all understand what's on the line, but doesn't hurt to have a little humble pie, uh, before you get to eating in the tournament. So we also had a few, uh, super chats here that I wanted to get to, um, Dick still wagon, $10 super chat. I'm very upset about this in capital letters. Uh, we feel you, uh, Dick, and we appreciate your support and Chris R four ninety nine super chat underrated aspect to this game in particular this looked and sounded like a wisconsin home game show up to indy boiler fans and that's another aspect of it that's very true wisconsin did travel well uh, a little closer to them from to minnesota than obviously west lafayette um but i do expect purdue to have very heavy purdue fan purdue contingent crowds in indianapolis and if they're able to make it to the second weekend in Detroit as well. Uh, so make sure you come to Indy. Don't give up Bill Bill. I know he put in the chat that he's 67 years old and his patience wore thin. And it's okay. You're forgiven. Uh, but don't give up your tickets. Come on out. We want to meet you, Bill Bill, and everybody else that's going to hang out with us. Uh, so let's, let's take a quick uh, commercial break. And then we'll get on to the second half of the show, maybe get into some individual player evaluations and 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 look ahead to tomorrow or whatever we want to do um, to here to to kind of round second here on the show. But I want to give a, we want to give a shout out to our guys over at Autograph. Yeah, so Autograph, uh, the app we've been working with for a couple weeks at this point. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, it's just an app that you can get all your your Purdue coverage or whatever you know college team that you want all their coverage in one specific spot. It's really easy to navigate through. So you're going to, you know, our podcast will eventually show up. And a lot of the, the Purdue content you consume anyways, be there one simple app, and then you can get rewarded for it too. So there's different like leaderboards to show who's interacting the most, who's clicking on the most articles, podcasts, commenting, interacting with other people, um, just kind of creating that community feel. And then they're also, and the other way is they're they're giving really cheap tickets. They've given tickets to Purdue, Wisconsin, Purdue, Michigan State, some of the Big Ten tourney. They have a VIP package going out for the Elite Eights. 
Um, and it's all free. You just have to sign up, use code bits, um, and then get all your content one place. Really easy app to use. And then you have the chance to get really cheap tickets or, or other rewards in the future from it. Um, they are now on Android as well as Apple. So um, both there, the link is you know shown up at the bottom of the screen. We'll also put up a QR code right now as I pull it up. So you can just use this QR code, scan it, use code bits, completely free get all your coverage in one specific spot. Yeah, and uh, absolutely great app. Uh, one that it just centralizes everything that you want to do in terms of uh, watching podcasts, watching, uh, consuming content in terms of articles and blogs that are being written out there from all your favorite Purdue sites. And it gives you the benefit of earning points to get rewards. Um, sign up, use code bits, get rewarded for the things that you already do. So, yeah. Appreciate Autograph um, working with us here today and for this, this what last third of the season or whatever. So um, I don't know. We want to flow. There's Braggs. I was waiting for him. You're, you're I'm bad. I didn't know what to do for a second. Um, <laughs> do we want to flow into specific Purdue? There's, I mean, there's, we already have a bunch of comments. Wherever you guys want. Yeah. Well. We got a bunch of comments loaded up. We'll save that for the end. But okay. yeah, if we want to get into individual performance, um, you you guys kind of lead the way here. You guys are the expert analysts, and I'll just do the yell, the yelling and rambling. I don't think we can wait any longer without giving Zach Eady props yep. for becoming Purdue's all time leading scorer. Um, when you think about his trajectory from starting playing basketball six years ago to going to IMG, being on one of the lower level teams at IMG, getting recruited by Purdue, reclassifying, being ranked in the four hundred. Uh, you know, mid 400s in terms of player rankings coming into Purdue, not being able to catch a ball when he got here. Anytime you interview players, they just talk about the fact that it wasn't a matter of whether he could play, whether he could shoot, he couldn't catch a ball. And Painter just said, keep passing it to him, keep passing it to him. Eventually he's going to figure it out. And once he does, he's going to be unstoppable. Painter knew something that we all didn't. Um, and Zach Eady, after all of that time, now becomes Purdue's all-time leading scorer passing some absolute Purdue legends and greats out there, the likes of Rick Mount and Joe Barry Carroll, some of those other guys to be the top rebounder and be the top all-time point scorer in Purdue history. So props to Zach Eady. Congrats on everything that you've accomplished so far. Yeah, he was, um, you know, it, like I know he missed the free throw at the end of regulation, which was tough, but at the same time, like what a weapon a guy like that is who's so efficient, you know, scoring the basketball and, one of your only avenues to try to stop him is just by fouling him. And he still can go to the free throw line and kill you from there. I mean, he almost won them the game in overtime by just getting to the free throw line time and again, and, and making those free throws in high pressure moments too. Uh, even after he missed the one at the end of regulation, then he made however many in a row in overtime. I mean, for a guy, his size, that's unusual, and we take it for granted here. I can promise you if they start fouling Willie Berg, all due respect, I don't think he's going to be able to make free throws at that kind of a clip. Most big guys can't, and he does. Um, that's just another point to just the greatness uh, that Zach Eady is uh, as he is about to become the two-time National Player of the Year. And so, yeah, man, I mean, appreciate him while you got him. We got six more games potentially here with Zach Eady as a Boilermaker. Uh, so I understand for fans are, this is, this is scary hours now, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the moment. We were everybody. We kept saying, there's never going to be this moment where you're going to feel comfortable going into March and they could be undefeated and you'd still have nerves walking into March, even against the 16 seed. So we don't count our chickens here in West Lafayette. So, you know, uh, but at the same time, you know, try to enjoy and appreciate these final six games with Zach Eady. And I'm not going to say it any differently here today. Six games, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I mean, what, what else is there to say about Zach Eady? Like, like you guys kind of summed it up of going from where he was to being the most dominant player in college basketball for two years in a row. Um, and, you know, his, his basketball career is not going to be done after this. And that might be even the most impressive thing. And, and I know there's lots of people that are going to be like, ha he can't play in the NBA, all that stuff. I, I don't care. The fact that Edie has a legitimate chance to become a pro in the NBA, whether it works out, we'll see. Edie went from where he was with development through the 
through the coaching staff and just his hard work, um, his dedication and all that. Like he's going to have a legit chance. What hopefully, at, you know, after six more games of, of winning at Purdue, um, it, it's just, it's so impressive what he does and, and what he's been able to do and, and just continues to do for this program, both on the court, off the court. Um, and just, yeah, it, it Purdue is, is, in, is just so much better off, um, in, as a program like now compared to when ed started and that's saying something because it's not like purdue was in a bad spot when ed came into the program either oh no doubt and you know i obviously there's got to be some things that happen in march still um but you know i like to call this kind of the golden era of purdue basketball even going back to the isaac haas and, and kind of pj thompson and, and carson edwards uh, uh years other than one down year um, which we don't count because they didn't have a tournament that year. Yeah. Um, other than one down year, this has been just an absolute golden era of Purdue basketball. They just need to make that final step up in March to make it to the final four. And I think it'll just wrap a nice little bow on this time period for, for Zach Eady and for, for all the players that helped to build the program to the point where it is today and to Matt Painter. Yep. And and just how many, how many games even this season have it just, just, there, there's two parts of just and even today if Purdue wins it's the same thing of like wow Purdue like this isn't even a close game if Edie doesn't play as well as he does and then also being like well what are you supposed to say about him because he's just that good um and congrats to him all-time what now all-time leading scorer and all-time leading rebounder in Purdue history right yep yep um and still plenty more games to go. So it's going to be a fun ride. I'm excited. Craig's excited. Braggs is also excited. Um, is there anything within the specific game that we wanted to talk about with Edie? Or more just keep it high level there? Yeah, I mean, can't get baited into that technical. He's kind of flirted yeah. with it a couple of different times out here. Um, I think, obviously, if this was the NCAA tournament and not the Big Ten tournament, Zach probably has the wherewithal uh, not to get baited into that. But... He's shown uh, a different level of aggression at times on the court this year and been a little bit more demonstrative. And I think he's just got to be a little bit careful of that um, as we get into the NCAA tournament. But obviously not something I don't think anybody's worried about. But 28 points, 11 rebounds, that was all really good. The one stat that had charted really well uh, over the last four or five games um, since the last time we lost actually to Ohio State was his turnover numbers had never been higher than two in any of those games. And he did have four turnovers today. Um, so obviously I uh, would like to clean those things up as well um, going into March. Um, but it's just another dominant performance from a points and rebounding standpoint, like he always has. And protecting the rim too. And that's where yep. when we get to the off season, we'll, we're, there's going to be some log talks about what this, this defense will be next year without Zach Eady. But for now, we don't worry about that. We just worry about what's going on and tomorrow's selection Sunday. We'll see the draw where Purdue, um, I mean, Purdue is going to get the the Indy or the Midwest region. They're going to play in Indy the first two rounds. If they are to make it farther, they'll, I, they're going to be in Detroit. And then obviously if they were to make the final four, that will be in Phoenix. Um, who was it? There's a comments. I think I started. Oh, uh, from Tree Kamel said, hopefully said, hopefully we get to play on Friday. From my understanding of the schedule, the Indy region is Friday, yep. Sunday. Um, and then I believe Detroit, again, if Purdue makes it that far, um, that is also Friday, Sunday. So both for both of the the first weekend and second weekend, if Purdue was able to make it that far, they they are um, they would play both Friday and Sunday. Um, okay, can I? Or oh, never mind. Um, sorry, I got sidetracked. You're fine. Let's let's bring up some some individual stats. So Ed, we said twenty eight points, eleven rebounds, three blocks. Does have the four turnovers. Um, only has the two fouls very quickly into game, no fouls from there. I think one thing I, I want to, as we, as I bring up the stats briefly, um, somebody commented that basically you're not going to win many games by, you know, if nobody's in double figures besides for one, uh, I'm trying to find the exact comment right here. And, and there's just, it, it's hard for me too, but either way, like the one thing I want to point out about that is like, yes, nobody besides Edie got into specifically double figures, but Fletch nine, TKR nine, Jones nine, Gillis eight, Braden seven. It wasn't like it wasn't still it still wasn't like a good offensive performance from from especially Lawyer and Smith in terms of scoring the ball. But like it wasn't like he was getting absolutely no help. It was just the help was a lot more spread out than what we're used to. Of usually it's Braden gets fifteen and then it's Jones or Lawyer or 
Gillis or you know Heidi has had a couple games or whatever of they get to 12. Um, this time it was just everybody stuck in that eight point region or so. Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, I really thought at the end of the first half, having to get through that a lot without Zach, I was actually really happy with the fact that there were contributions coming from multiple guys instead of it just having to be Braden and Fletch or just being Braden and Lance. So I, I was really pleased in terms of the performance of other people stepping up and whether it was four points, six points, eight points, whatever. Um, we had seven different guys that had scored at the uh, end of the first half. So I was pleased with that personally. Um, obviously, you need more from Braden, I think. Not a great shooting game from him. Yeah. I also, I just, look, he he looked fine, right? Um, but I think maybe one of the more telling things is, you know, Chucky Hepburn had, I think, eight points total in our first two meetings uh, against them. Um, and I did, two, there were a lot of times out there, it just didn't look like Braden could move quick enough to stay with Chucky today. Um, I didn't think he attacked the rim with the same intensity that he usually does off that pick and roll action. So I, I just, I don't feel like Braden was a hundred percent obviously today. I think, I mean, they said that coming into the game. Um, uh, so I think, you know, it looks like a much different version of Braden Smith that we've seen all year when it, when it rolls around on Friday. And hopefully they can circum circumvent that here, uh, going into next week. And that's certainly something they're going to have to monitor, uh, hopefully they can win Friday's game convincingly yep. and uh, then be geared up for Sunday for a chance to go to the Sweet 16. Not to look ahead. We're not looking ahead to anything. But at the same time, playing 36 minutes you know, of a physical game is encouraging that he was able to get through the whole thing. You know, So I think that's the yeah. other aspect of it too. So uh, yeah. credit to Braden for battling through. And if this – I like – if this was around a 64, 32, or, or beyond game, I think we see Braden try to get to that extra gear more. Um, yeah. I, I do think we would like, I, I think, per, I do think Purdue wanted to win this, but at the same time, I think they also understood that like this isn't March Madness. And so, although they were still were trying and all that, there, I don't think Braden especially tried to get to that extra gear that he probably could have. Um, and we'll see. I, I, I fully expect, I fully expect them to be fine like per, all the guards like i expect none of this to carry over to friday um and it's just like starting new and, and they're going to be good well and to that point um chris r says in the chat need to corral more 50 50 balls and uh you know that that is to that point like laying it out on the line here coming up you know i i, I i'm not gonna act like they weren't laying it on the line today they certainly were trying to win but you know you only get 51 shots up to um, Wisconsin 74 and I get Purdue is about efficiency, but then you look at the offensive rebounds. They did get 12, which was more than Wisconsin, but just beating to the 50, 50 balls in general, which aren't always rebounds, you know, it's going to get you a few more shots. Right. So, um, you know, yeah, I, but a lot, a lot of that is free throws too, because those aren't counted as shot attempts then. So, uh, when Purdue that's shoots, fair. When Purdue shoots 32 free throws, that's going to throw that shot total shot comparison off as well. But um, yeah, I thought there was a few times it looks like some business decisions were made today on some 50-50 balls, and I am 100% fine with that. But at the same time, Zach got on the floor at the end. He, 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 yeah. he ended up rolling out of bounds, which would have been a big possession if he'd have been able to corral that. And Fletcher Lawyer laying out across half court to save the over and back. Um, you know, so, you know, we certainly still saw the hustle and that's what I mean. Certainly not a pretty game, not trying to sell, you know, uh lipstick on a pig, but at the same time, like, you know, this is March. This is what March madness is going to be. You might have to win an ugly game and, and Purdue was trading buckets at the end. Purdue was trading buckets in overtime or getting to the free throw line. And Mason Gillis hit some big time shots. I'm every time Mason goes up, you know, in that elbow corner, three ball I'm, I'm feeling better and better every time he raises up the one in the in the far corner that he shot in overtime did not look good coming off his hand um before we get into any other players just be, before i lose this thought i i did want to bring this up on the blocking call they called for zach edy where there's a charge it was a hundred percent a charge yeah. but the reason i want to bring it up is we've been seeing a lot more of this lately and um, to me, Purdue has to scout this and figure out how to be careful about this 
because I think teams are starting to figure out when Edie is trying to roll. They set up that top of the screen. They're doing the Chicago action at the top. Edie hands it off to Fletcher Lawyer or Braden Smith or Lance Jones, and then he rolls to the basket. And you've got players trying to set up a charge on Zach. And a lot of times here lately, Zach is running that guy over. And I get he's got a lot of momentum behind him, and he's a big dude, so it's hard for him to stop on a dime. But they have to figure out how to 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 circumvent this. This is that is a real issue that could get Zach Eady in foul trouble here in the tournament. And if that's happening, um, here I'll, let's go to the board. The board. We're going to the board, baby. X's and O's with the with Joe. The, our award winning segment here on boilers in the stands going to be winning oscars and emmys or whatever they're going to give us for this this is the greatest moment for all of us that tune in to boilers in the stands where joe hits us with some chalk, chalkboard knowledge i couldn't finish my sentence i'm an idiot <laughs> no you're good you're good um okay trying to get this there we go so okay so what we're saying right normal pick and roll and brain's going to come off Edie's diving, and then this defender here has been the one that he steps up here and basically just takes this charge, right? And, and Edie, it should have been a charge today on Edie, 100%, um, but it is what it is. Now, I, I think it, it's just going to come down to Brayden. Like, if he sees that that's going to happen, and, and I trust Brayden in this this aspect, like, Purdue's already running the counter for it. Um, and so it's just that, you know, as Brayden comes off this big, uh, you know, either he's going to hedge, where it means he's going to step out here, or he's going to be in drop coverage. What Purdue does is they always have Gillis replace this role. And if Gillis's man is the one stepping up to take Edie here, that means that Gillis is just going to be completely wide open anyways. And you see just this simple action where Gillis replaces this role as Edie dives. It already puts teams in such a dilemma. Do you put two on Edie? Do you allow Gillis to get, get going? Do you just kind of sell out on Edie and Gillis? And now Brain's probably going to try to get all the way to the rim or get to a pull-up. Do you... You know, try to force Brain just to re go back, but now you know that on this backside you have a two on one or a three on two, inclu including this corner. Um, so the the counter is there. Now the other thing, and I, and I want to go back and watch this. And so if Wisconsin did this, then that's my bad, and that's just honestly really good adjustment from them. The one thing defenses could do to probably counter that is there's and that's it's all going to also only be if you have bigs that you're comfortable with. Tyler Wall is big enough where Wisconsin's comfortable with him down low if needed, and they'll figure it out from there is they could probably have this big kind of just step up here, try to force Brain back, but then eventually just switch. And so this big can take Gillis on this roll, and then you trust this forward stepping up here on Edie. So that would be the one thing to look for if um, teams do go to that type of look. But the counter's already there. Like It's just going to be a flip out to Gillis. That, that's already something that Purdue runs, has in their system. Uh, it's just going to be up to one, Edie, recognizing that, hey, I can't plow through this dude, and then two, brain recognizing like, hey, Gillis is going to be wide open. Yeah, it's a, it's a great breakdown. Um, we had our guy Brian Tonsoni here from Delphi Bracketology and Assembly Call, the rival podcaster, but we love him uh, very dearly here at Boilers and Sense saying, Joe with the board might have to steal that idea. You, it's not Go stealing. It, yeah. You are more than welcome to use that on your platforms, uh, Coach, T, Coach T and um, – you know, we've stolen plenty of ideas from you guys as well. So sharing is caring here in this business. And we care a lot about you, Brian. We appreciate you tuning in. But X's and O's with the with Joe, with the Joe. Uh, <laughs> X's and O's with the Joe. Maybe that's what it needs to be. That's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> Bill Bill saying to trademark that board. Uh, I'm so real quick, I want to, th and my camera is being weird. Um, no, but it, it looks fine on my end. Okay, a little, looks maybe a little fuzzy. bit of fuzz. Yeah. If anybody, like, because I've tried looking, can I have been able to find anything? If anybody knows where I could get one of these, but it's like Purdue logo, either in the middle or on the backside or something, let me know because I'll, I'll buy it. I just, I have not been able to find something. Why don't you just I get a fun. sticker? I guess, but wouldn't that be, I feel like it'd make it hard to like draw over if I need to. You think That's you're gonna? That might, you think you're gonna draw up uh, designs at half, right at the middle of half court? I mean, you might, That's you know, fair. for an That's inbounds. Fair. That's not a bad idea. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm full of good ideas. That's what I bring to the table here at Boilers in the Stands. Um, so that was good. A little um, 
threw a little curveball there, but that is a big observation I've been making here lately. And Ant Wright's been all over it, uh, talking about it and 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 put it on display, feeding the Zach Eady gets away with everything, uh, people and crowd. Um, you know, I, 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 it's somewhat of a joke, you know, I, I, Adam I okay, I'm going to step so, in for Ant's because Ant's very good at social media. And so yeah. he knows, he knows what will get clicks there. He's good at also calling out like, and, and this is also, this is my take with ED too, but he's good at calling out when ED is like, Hey, that should have been a follower or whatever. He also does go the other way when yep. it is. the yep. other way. I, He's been one of the, the front runners of trying to show people why Zach ED isn't in the paint for three seconds yes, and has 100%. gone in detail with many people that just want to continue to rail against that. I mean, it's a tradition, like unlike any other, especially in basketball, any level, especially in college basketball, but certainly big 10 basketball, every school complains about the refs. Every school complains about the fouls. With Purdue, it gets even more ratcheted up because every school, you know, has to, you know, execute a, an extremely physical brand of basketball to try to beat Purdue. And so if you're going to play physical, there's going to be free throws. There's going to be calls. Very rarely is a team going to, or, the, um, you know, an officiating crew going to swallow the whistle. We saw a game earlier this season with Tennessee where there was like 90 free throws shot in the game between I both. And, and nobody wants to see that. But at the same time, if you're going to dare the refs to make the call and hope that they're not going to, then you can't complain when the calls are made. It's really that simple. And yes, the free throw disparity was big today. It is many games for Purdue because you've got to play physical against Purdue defensively and you are avoiding getting into the paint where you're going to have more contested shots and physicality because you're avoiding Zach Eady. That's just what that's part of why those numbers are skewed the way they are. And if you're a stat watcher or if you're just going to be completely biased, then you're going to say that Purdue gets away with murder and Purdue gets to, you know, have the luxury of the calls, but it's simply not true. Um, but uh, we also are fair to say when they do get lucky and Purdue on that particular call for the charge, uh, in the blocking call, it was a charge a hundred percent and Purdue needs to do everything they can to try to avoid those calls and avoid that contact here in March. So Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, so, uh, well, you just never know when I'm going to finish a sentence. So, yeah, like uh, you catch me off guard when you stop talking sometimes. Yeah, I know. It catches me off guard too. Trust me, my wife just fainted over there. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's get into it. I mean, where else do you guys want to go as far as individual performance or, or wherever you want to go? I mean, we don't have to go too much longer. I want to get to the, the, the highlighted comments of our show. Uh, and then we can wrap this up and, and look ahead to tomorrow for our uh, bracket reveal show, which will be a lot of fun. So when are we when are we doing that? Oh, uh, well, I mean, we reveal? can either do it. We can either do a little production on air, but we can either do it right <laughs> as you know, the bracket reveal show goes live and react to it as it comes. That's always a lot of fun but it draws the show out a little longer or we can wait till the bracket is completely revealed and then go live and react to it. Comments, so, comment and comment whether you guys want it live or after, and we'll figure it out from there. Yeah. I think it'd be more fun to do it live. Cause then we get to react and, and then have that emotional reaction to who we're playing and where we're playing and what we're playing, which is basketball that answers that question. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know that there's a ton on individual play today. Um, I, I mean, obviously, we want to get into some more, but right. um, I, I, have one, I have one player, but you go. Well, I was just going to go ahead and say that I, I thought Miles and Cam both showed some really good flashes today. Um, I, again, defensively, um, especially I thought Miles just showed that he was much better today, but he also um, showed that he was confident to take shots and, you know, hit, hit one of the five three pointers that we did make out there. Um, Cam, I thought gave relatively good minutes again. They're both minus on the day in terms of plus minus overall. Uh, but I think with both of them, you're just trying to find out when I throw them in in March in a pressure situation, are they going to be able to handle it and how are they going to be able to react to it? 
Yeah, and, and who I wanted to shout out um, in court. Well, I don't. I'm not shouting out Kaufman. Corey Lesney goes. Why didn't Kaufman play more? Um, uh, maybe per- Painter didn't want to tinker with the rotation or whatever. But it's Gillis. Gillis. This was a fantastic game from Gillis. Um, even though it was a, a fantastic game in terms of him doing things that's like him just do like. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk it back a little bit. It was a good game from Gillis in a lot of aspects. The turnovers were very bad. I, okay, <laughs> the turnovers were very very bad. But he was just like, especially when Edie was out, he was so physical on the boards. He get, ends up with nine in the game. I think that's his season high. You saw him just fight for a few. Yes, two for five from three, great. You know, yes, I mean, sure, you'd like to see him go three for five, whatever. Two for five, that's good. Knocks down a two. He was aggressive in getting to his shot. Um, but yes, I'm going to walk back my original statement of he did some fantastic things. He also, some of the turnovers were were very, very bad. But in ju- aside, the turnovers aside, I really liked what I saw from him. Yeah, go ahead, Craig. I, no, I, I 100%. Um, you know, a couple of the turnovers, well, really all three of them um, were, were just pretty glaringly yeah. bad. But outside of that, I, I thought he did play extremely well. well As terms- we were talking, something right. popped up on my screen from The Athletic, and the headline was, more March woes for the Boilers. Like, is this the narrative? Oh, yeah. Give me a friggin' well, break. Like, it's the I mean, Big Ten tournament. This, like... This is the standard That's that Purdue clicks, is at now. I mean, it's A, how you get clicks, but it is also how Purdue is now perceived. As Matt Painter said on senior day, this class, every time they lose, the, the fans storm the court. Now, in a Big Ten tournament, you're not going to storm the court. but Except they Michigan also, State. But yes, and, so. Yeah, State. and Michigan State, which we, me and Craig were at that game. But we'll let Payne, don't let the facts get in the way of, the, of a good story. And, you know, in essence, though, and, and Michigan State shouldn't storm the court with all those banners of national championships up there. When you're a program like that, and I'm watching Michigan or IU storming the court when they beat a team in the regular season, like you've now kind of relinquished this blue blood, you know, stuff like that. That's my take, but kids can have fun. I get that whole aspect too, but Michigan state didn't storm the court. You're right, Craig, because you know, they've, they've hold themselves to a higher standard, but Purdue is at a higher standard. So when they lose, this is the reaction it gets. I mean, you know, I have all sorts of people in my mentions today uh, that are real quiet all season long. Purdue yep. loses once, you're going to get a lot of people coming at you. Uh, that's the nature of the beast when you're at the top of the mountain, and that's where Purdue's been for the last few years. And they have to they have to do this here in March, or they're going to get it more, and it'll just happen every year until they accomplish the ultimate goal. That's just the facts. That's just life, and Purdue's going to have to wear that. And let's hope. Purdue can get through it, but um, back to the Trey Kaufman Ren point of, you know, the rotational minutes. Did, is there anything of note here in your graph that we have shown here many times here on our post game shows as far as rotational minutes and who's playing with what that that stand out to you, Joe? I know you you might want to explain it to some of our new viewers. Yeah. So um, any box that's highlighted, that means that that player played that minute. Um, obviously, there's you know. They they don't sub in and out at exact minutes, so give or take thirty seconds. But um, I mean, obviously, Edie playing only the first two minutes and he only played eight in the first half is huge, and that's just where it, you know, and it's been brought up as like the rotation and all that. Like, why is it so weird? Like, Edie when Edie has not had to go to the bench for foul trouble, like basically the whole season, let alone in the first two minutes. So the rotation from there is gonna just naturally be weird, combined with your kind of. Um, you're favoring Braden a little bit combined with Fletcher wasn't great defensively. So I think he got yanked a couple times for defense. I mean, that's, so that's where that first half is just so weird. The second half is I think going to be a little bit closer to what you're going to see more of. Obviously Braden does get in foul trouble too, which throws a little bit of a wrench into it. Like, uh, but for the most part, it's going to be your closing lineup is going to be Braden, Lance, Fletch, Gillis, Edie. Heidi's going to come in for defense um, if needed. Um, we'll see if Colvin can eventually get that spot at all, but, that's, I mean, overtime especially. Like that's, that's going to be the the closing rotation as it should be. That like Gillis deserves to play all those minutes, especially when he's rebounding like he did today. Um, yeah, I, I'd say like this is, this is not the normal. Like, and, and this isn't Painter like tink. Well, it's Painter tinkering a little bit for sure with with Colvin and maybe some Heidi minutes, but he was also just kind of like forced into it. Um, if Edie doesn't get in foul trouble, if Braden isn't you know a little bit managing minutes or not managing minutes but like 
just managing that, um, I think it just looks a little bit closer to normal. Yeah. So there's a little breakdown of the rotations uh, here. You know, so I'm sorry. I'm seeing Jim Cook in here going $10 super chat. And that's not how a super chat works, Jim. He's our sales guy at CHGO. And if you're going to shortchange me here, Jim, then we're going to have issues when I come to the studio on Tuesday. So watch your mouth. And, uh, you know, you got this uh, how do you do fellow kids kind of look going in your profile picture. Thank you very much, Jim. So uh, let's continue on. Do we have anything else we want to break down as far as a game perspective or an individual player perspective? Or do we want to get into the highlighted comments of the day and then uh, move on to watching Nebraska, Illinois? I'm not even sure what the score is on that game. Nebraska's up 31-24. 31 to 24 Nebraska on a heater. Uh, the Nebraska women's basketball team got to the big 10 championship and then maybe their men's team will get to the big 10 championship. Certainly uh, a resurgence in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska with basketball. So uh, interesting. So do you guys have anything else or do you want to get into the highlighted comments? I'm good with highlighting comments. Yeah, let's do comments because there's some of them I want to get in. There's some of the comments. Yeah, it'll open up a little bit. It'll open up a bigger discussion for sure. Uh, Okay, I'll save some. I'll go down the list and then prioritize some for the end. Uh, William, uh, William, William Nagay says some of the hypocrisy from Purdue fan social media today has been tiring. Did you want to win or want rest? In my opinion. This was pretty much an ideal result. And we talked about this at the start of the show. Like there's no perfect way to lose a game. We all had said that we wouldn't have been upset if they lost. I had spent all week at CHGO studios saying I didn't want Purdue to win the big 10 tournament. Um, Cause I just would prefer them to, you know, save some of the mileage. And we did kind of come to the conclusion last week that if they were to lose on the second day, that like, that's the most ideal day to lose and so we were this isn't after the fact and and just using this as a coping mechanism we were saying these things last week now that being said william as the game's going on when mason gillis hits a big three or fletcher lawyer hits a big three am i not jumping out of my seat and pump pounding my chest and and getting fired up for my team of course i was so there's a little bit of hypocrisy there a hundred percent so and and as bobby riddell the play-by-play guy uh, for Purdue Boilermakers uh, radio said, you know, uh, when he was on with us last week and a friend of the show, he said it was, it's a win-win, you know, and, and some people don't like to accept win-wins in life, but I'm going to take our win-win approach here at the big 10 tournament. If they had won, great. They lost. There's also some positives that you can take from that on a few different levels that we've went over. So um, that's kind of where we stand with that. Let's uh, keep moving it down the list. We got a question for you, Joe. Uh, what happened to Painter playing offense defense at the end of the game? Brad Soltz. This is where if you are kind of um, like the only thing that makes sense in my head is if you're kind of of the belief that pain, not that pain, Painter was Painter was not trying to lose. I don't want or any of the players. I don't want that to come across, but it's just more of like a, we'll just see what happens and live with it type. Um, Cause I was surprised like this painter has gone to offense defense, like 10 minutes into the second half before um, yeah. it was, it was shocking, especially when like, it wasn't a good game from Fletch. It wasn't like a great game um, from Lance Jones, especially in the second half and, and stuff like that. Like I, it was surprising to see. Um, I, I think, you know, it's yeah. It's something we'll see back in March. I would assume. I think it was just more of an anomaly this game. Uh, and here. and last game, I and called it game. out last game too. Um, he didn't do the normal offense for defense against Michigan State at the end um, or today, either one. So take that for what you want. Yep. Um, maybe a little gamesmanship, not showing his hand for March. Or maybe he was just testing his guys. I don't know. He's got. We all got our conspiracy theory hats on, or at least yep. I do. Jer- Jeremy Hunter, how far do you have to slide on your back before a travel is called? Good Lord, Craig. As long as you stay on your back and don't roll, you could literally slide the entire length of the court. Um, Till the momentum stops, yeah. Yeah, till the till the momentum stops. So mm-hmm. if you turn and roll, then it's a travel. Um, as oh. long as you're flat on your back, you're good. That's interesting. I never knew that. So we learn something new every day here on Boilers in the Stands. Good question, Jeremy. 
uh, making us all smarter basketball fans. Joe and Craig are every single day. And then I offset that by making you guys dumber basketball fans with my comments. So we appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, so we've got KM KMK V six in the chat saying, do you think painter is preparing to expand the rotation for the NCAA tournament or use Heidi and Colvin more? Did Colvin improve and or is Painter saving him as a secret weapon? We've gone over a little bit of this, but Joe, we can um, you know touch on it again here uh, if she didn't hear the answer. Yeah, I, I still think it's going to be your main seven, eight man rotation. Um, I think what Colvin has shown these past two games is I wouldn't be shocked if Painter gives him like a two minute run at some point and just see what happens. But I, I still think um colvin specifically like I, I think he's still more towards the end of the bench heidi is the seventh man to me like there's no doubt in my mind yeah. he's been the seventh man like painters had the same exact rotation for about eight straight games barring foul issues um and it is heidi and gillis first off the bench you're gonna get a couple minutes from first you're maybe gonna get a couple minutes from morton maybe it's a couple minutes from colvin now um, but it's generally those top seven and then first comes in to spell ed when for the few minutes that ed doesn't play yeah, um, since January 31st, Cam Heidi's gone 15, 10, 10, 6, 4, 19, 19, 18, 13, 8, 14 in terms of his minutes. So there was like a two game stretch there after he started going to Cam as the first person off the bench with Gillis coming in. He went back to Morton for a couple of games and then he switched back to Cam. And ever since then, um, that's Cam's spot. And I think where you see the 8 and 14 in those last two is giving Miles more run um, to see you know, just what miles can do, um, if he needs to go to him in the tournament. So I cam's got his minutes. Those are his. Yep. hundred percent. So we have a couple different questions, which we've kind of touched on Braden's mobi mobility, Brian Bennett in the chat yeah. asking, I would love to get your guys take was Braden hampered a bit in his mobility. I thought so. No one will admit it. Rest will be good. And then, uh, somebody also asked Brad salt, did Braden seem hundred percent to everyone in this game? He didn't have the extra gear. I mean, they might've asked this before we touched on it, but we have, but uh, Craig, you can echo the sentiments if you'd like. I, was, I think one of them was somebody who came in after we'd already talked about it, but Joe and I have already mentioned that, that yeah, it, it just didn't look like he was hitting that extra gear uh, trying to get to the rim. Um, when they're running that high ball screen and he gets downhill, looked like he had his man beat a couple of times and he just, didn't attack like he normally did. And I thought more specifically a few times where he was matched up with Chucky that it just didn't look like he was as quick in terms of his motion and range of motion laterally, especially. Um, so yeah, no, I don't think he was a hundred percent. I think they flat out said before the game that he was good to go when they say he's good to go, but they're going to monitor. They're telling you he's not a hundred percent, right? Like if he's a hundred percent, you have no reason to monitor. So. Yep. Um, hey, while everybody's hanging out, please hit that like button. Uh, if you're watching on the YouTube channel, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook or Twitter, we appreciate you, but it always helps us if you can head over to YouTube and subscribe to Brags in the Stands, and then you'll see the library of different shows for Boilers in the Stands and some of my Chicago sports coverage as well. Uh, but it always helps what we're trying to do here if you do that. Uh, TTG says in the chat, a smart team is going to swarm our guards and beat us that way. Joe, my response to that is like, is a smart team, Tennessee, Marquette, even Sanford, who is not a, a power <laughs> conference from early in the year. Does Arizona count for that? Does Michigan state count for that? Does Rutgers twice count for that? Um, and yeah, you're like, that is, that is, that is the way to do it. And it's you're saying, like and you're saying game. all of those teams you just listed tried that. Yeah, Marquette. Yeah. yeah, all of them tried it, and you know what Purdue did. In every one of them, they won. Now, is it a, like one of the best ways to try and beat Purdue for sure? But I, I think like to say like, oh, gonna pressure guards, Purdue's gonna lose. Like, that to me doesn't make sense. Of like, they Purdue has shown this entire season that they can do it. They have shown it throughout the entire year that elite teams like Tennessee, Marquette, and, and they're really aggressive. They're gonna get in ball handlers. They'll beat them. Whether and then. Even like Rutgers, and I know Rutgers doesn't have a, a good offense at all. They can handle that and still figure out ways to win on the road, at home, neutral sites against Ayers or against Bam. I guess Sona was more of a home game, but um, Gonzaga, Tennessee, Marquette, Gonzaga doesn't count for that. Tennessee, Marquette, neutral game like um, Sanford at home, who's going to be a good 13 seed. So if we're worried about like what about these pesky 15, 16 seeds, like does Purdue have to do it on the day that they play? 100. But 
like they've shown that they can do it against any team, any style um, throughout the entire season. Uh, Jimmy Pepper in the chat to my fear of teams trying to do that backdoor charge taken on Zach Eady before he turns and looks. And uh, Jimmy Pepper is saying, uh, and I don't know where he's getting this information, but he says the Purdue coaching staff has already sent in tapes on the play you're talking about because they believe opposing teams are creating dangerous situations. And, and to that point, I do somewhat understand where you're coming from that like when people like they said on the telecast, like it should have been a charge and they didn't call it a charge. And on the telecast, they said, well, what is Tyler wall supposed to do? Well, what is Zach Eady supposed to do? Right. Um, you know, so I don't know. Do you guys think, cause we talked about, and Joe did the X's and O's to break down how they can try to counter that. But do you think that that's a, a, a fair basketball move or a, ba- a fair basketball game plan to, to try to surprise Edie with a backdoor screen charge attempt? I don't know. However you want to phrase it. I think like today's with walls, I think totally fair and should have been a charge. I think it's just like any other charge block call though is, um, like I think it happened either yesterday, and it's like if you're still moving the slightest bit, like the rules, like that's a block. Um, wall was completely set, and that should have been charged. But that even out of fear, we have seen this a bunch. There's probably only been once or twice where it's like the guy was like fully completely set, and if they aren't, then that should be a block, from my understanding of the rule. And unless I'm wrong there, but um, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll move on. Uh, appreciate your chat there, Jimmy Pepper. Um, got a few more here before we wrap things up. Um, just trying to go through these Scott white asking Joe, but you know, Craig might know better. Uh, I do know I being do know. The, I know. the elder statesman. Joe Craig, knows too. Joe knows. Craig knows. Greg doesn't know. Craig anything. might've known off the top of his head. When though. was the <laughs> Craig knew off the top of his head. When was the last time the boilers had a 30 win season? Uh, 2017, 2018, that would have been Isaac Haas and PJ Thompson, Carson Edwards, all those guys. And it's the only time they've had a 30 win season and they are at 20, 29, 29. Yep. Uh, so we shall see if they can get to 30 next Friday in Indianapolis when bill bill will be joining us. And he has a good suggestion. He says, call the board Jackson action. I like I it. it. I like it. I like it. Jackson action here. Uh, that sounds like a great Twitter segment too, Joe. Like mm-hmm. honestly, where you yeah. do the exact same thing and do a video. Like if you, I mean, we could cut this clip from the show and I think it would do well, mm-hmm. but if you were doing those on your own too, True. I think those would do really well and really just highlight the genius that is Joe Jackson action Jackson. So good suggestion there. He also had another suggestion sticking with bill bill. And he says he's suggesting for our meetup next Friday that we go to the alley cat lounge in broad ripple. Uh, so I I've never been to the alley cat lounge in broad ripple, uh, but we'll have to, we're, we're going to look into those things maybe over the night. I'll look through it. And then when we do our, bracket reveal show we'll try to make an announcement or maybe we'll wait because i'm there's a strong likelihood we do a show before the tournament during the week next week uh so you know just a little production meeting here on the show live but we appreciate the suggestion bill bill i'll keep it in mind um once again a couple uh foreshadowing things but terry willis saying virginia lost in the acc finals before they won the championship the year after they lost to a sweet 16 just fyi i wanted to to use this to add like a few things in of um this loss isn't the end of the world so since 2013 only two teams have won their conference championship and then gone on to win the big or win the national championship so only twice in the past you know a little over a decade um on top of that what is what is a couple of others there was like um oh man it just slipped my mind well okay there's also like no no championship no uh, national championship team has ever lost their first round of the or not ever but since like 85 i think no team has lost the first round of the their conference championship and then goes on to win the national championship for purdue also every time they've lost they've gone on at least a six game winning streak 
There is six potential games left for Purdue in this season. Um, this one's maybe less of a trend and more of just a funny, you know, fun thing is. So the first month of the season, Purdue in November, they are winless or um, lossless. So they, they go perfect one seven and zero in the month of November in December, they have one loss in January, one loss in February, one loss in March, one loss. So that means they like, if, if you're following this, they already have their one loss for March. And then the last month of the season is in April. So we're, you just got a sandwich where the, the, the first month and the last month is no losses. You have one loss every month in between, and that's how you get to a national championship. But um, yeah, I think there's just a lot of things. And, you know, like Terry said, with the Virginia, they, they did it. Um, even UConn last year, they lost in their semis or whatever and go on to win the national championship. There are th little things you can take away from this game, but I think if for anybody in, in media and whatever will say it to get their clicks, no doubt. Um, for anybody to say specifically that because of this loss, they're going to lose in March, that just seems silly to me. So that, those were just a few of the things I wanted to throw out there. Okay. A um, couple more here. I just added a couple just to the thing. Mr. Adez says, how do I make a highlighted comment? Well, you just did because you have a Michael Jordan profile picture, Mr. Adez. And so that means anytime you have a comment, I'm going to do my best to make sure I see it and highlight it because you have the rightful goat in your profile picture. We appreciate you tuning in, Mr. Adez. Um, and then um, Corey Lesney says, who wants to see Edie versus Burns from NC State? NC State probably plays tonight, I'm assuming. I tuned in when McConnell hit the game-tying three last night. I saw it on social media, so I switched over to watch overtime. And I hadn't watched NC State all year. And within two and a half minutes of play, their big man, Burns, what's his first name again? DJ. DJ Burns. He, he became like my favorite player of all time. Like there's always like these, these, uh, these March darlings that fall. I fall in love with till the end of time. I'll still remember Omar Samhan, uh, and people of that. Like there's always a guy every year and DJ Burns, if they win tonight and make it to March madness beyond all, you know, hopes and win five days in a row when they, if they hadn't won or don't win tonight, they're not making the tournament at all and get an automatic bid. DJ Burns, so much fun to watch last night. This dude's a total tank. Uh, to watch him and Zach Eady would be a lot of fun. Corey Lesney for sure. Um, uh, David Jenkins says, now I can work on the farm tomorrow before selection show. Planting time. Uh, there you go, David. Get your work in. I just... I started that because I couldn't believe anybody was planting yet. So I want to know where David lives. Yeah. Well, man, you know, early bird gets the worm, Craig. Maybe you're slacking on your farm. Do you ever think of that? I, I don't. I don't grow crops. Well, we don't Greg. know what you do. You got sheep. Yes, you, you do, got, Greg. Yes, you, you got do. <laughs> lambs and sheep and and horses and whatever else no. you got going on out there. Just sheep. No. Just sheep. Just sheep. Just sheep. sheep. All right. That's fine. Um, so we got two more here. Um, and Corey Lesney says, Braggs, who starts week one for the Bears? You will be blocked the next time you ask me that question, Corey. I can't do it. This is my place to escape that conversation. And then Walrus Noises will finish it up because it'll look ahead to tomorrow's bracket reveal show. Uh, and I'll start with you, Craig, and, we'll, and then I'll kick it over to you, Joe. But he says, have y'all talked about Joe Lenardi not having us as the number one overall seed anymore? Uh, and that's a good question. With this loss, does that impact the exact seeding they get overall number one? And, and where do you guys stand with that as far as the one seed and being the overall number one seed in the March Madness tournament? Yeah, Lenardi moved him from one to three, and I think Delphi Bracketology moved him from one to three after the loss as well. Um, it just doesn't really mean a lot. Um, they're they're going to play in Indy. They're going to play in Detroit. You but it does say, affect who their two seed's going to be, right? Because like to, in, a, to a degree, but then there's also like regionality and who's played what two seeds twice already and that type of thing. So, well, actually, it doesn't matter for one versus two on that because it's later than the than the first two rounds. But there's other things that come into play with that too. So if, if you want to say like, all right, if everybody makes it to the Elite Eight, is it going to impact the quality of the two seed? Well, if you look at that two seed line, you know, how much are you cutting hairs between that? And then you're projecting all the way out to that and saying there aren't any upsets happening. My buddy, Josh Douglas, God bless his heart, was like, oh no, now we have to play Houston in the final four. And I'm like, dude, like <laughs> you skipped so many steps uh, until we get there. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> like there's a lot to happen between now and then. So the, the most important thing is there a one seed that they get Indy, that they get Detroit. Those things are going to happen no matter what at this point. So I, I don't, I think it's a nothing burger. Okay. Joe, any thoughts? No, nah, Craig, Craig summed it up all good there. Okay. Yep. All right. Indy next Friday. It is, um, I'm hoping I got the notification in the email yesterday that some of our boilers in the stands gears could be getting to us here maybe in the next day or two. Uh, if you go to Teespring and search, if you if you Google search Teespring and uh, Bragg's in the stands, we do have uh, an apparel store. So if you like this show and boilers in the stands is something that represents you as a fan, um, you know, we appreciate you going out and buying our merch. Nothing would be cooler for us than to see you guys rocking our gear in the stands at Purdue games. Uh, and we have a lot of different selections on there from t-shirts to long sleeve, to hoodies, to cups, to stickers. Uh, so you got a lot of different options on there. So again, if you go to Teespring or Google search Teespring and brags in the stands, you will be able to find, uh, those here. So if you look here, it's, uh, teespring.com slash store slash brags in the stands, uh, where you can find some of your boilers in the stands gear. Uh, so I'm excited for us to get our shipment in here soon. So, or that, you can just click on the link that I put in the chat and go buy one right now. That's right. Yes, you can. Uh, and it's in our description on our YouTube page too. If you're watching on YouTube, our Teespring store link is within our description as well. Scott White saying, always a great show. Thanks again, guys. We appreciate you always tuning in, Scott. We will be back tomorrow for the March Madness reveal. Stay tuned. Make sure you check your notifications uh, for what time we'll start. We should be going live, I think, right when the reveal is, but... Uh, we will be live no matter what tomorrow night, tomorrow evening uh, for the Bracket Reveal Show. So we're all really excited for that. So that wraps things up. Purdue drops to Wisconsin here in the semifinals in overtime. So Wisconsin moves on to either play Nebraska or Illinois. Nebraska leads right now. So we'll all go over to that game. Thanks again for everybody that tuned in. Please, once again, hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook, Boilers in the Stands, Brags in the Stands, Boiler Diehards, Feed the Post. We're doing it all for you as far as Big Ten and Purdue basketball content is concerned. So thanks again, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. And always, Boiler up.